you go on Lucy Turner, it was like going on Concord today. It was something you'd tell your friends about forevermore. She was this tremendous, magnificent ship. It was England's first four funnel passenger liner, the Greyhound of the Atlantic. The war was on. Everybody knew the war was on. They couldn't think that a ship of that size, under the protection of the Royal Navy, could ever be lost at sea. When the RMS Lusitania set sail from New York on a rainy spring morning in 1915, bound for Liverpool, England, those aboard expected a routine transatlantic voyage. Instead, their journey would end in a tragedy that would lay bare the savagery of 20th century war. Production of this program was made possible in part by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Educational Telecommunications Association and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. On the southern tip of Ireland lies the small fishing village of Cove, population 15,000. A hundred years ago, this was a bustling transatlantic seaport. Millions of immigrants bid Ireland a final farewell here as they boarded steamships bound for America. Back then, Cove was known as Queenstown. On May 7th, 1915, Queenstown was to become center stage in a tragedy that to this day the world has not forgotten. It's one of those tragedies that, in a sense, refuses to die. The fact that you had this beautiful liner, well known, sailing along quite happily one minute and 20 minutes later it was gone. There was a sense of shock, the sense of horror at the speed of it, and also at the loss of so many people, so many innocent people. The story of what befell the Lusitania began 18 years before its final voyage in the summer of 1897. Great Britain was celebrating 60 years of rule by Her Majesty Queen Victoria. The empire was at its zenith. Britain ruled a quarter of the Earth's surface and nearly a quarter of its people. Its power was based on controlling the seas. Britain had the largest navy and merchant fleet in the world. For 40 years, British ships had won the coveted Blue Riband, an award given for the fastest transatlantic crossing. But by the turn of the century, Queen Victoria's nephew, Kaiser Wilhelm II, was determined that Germany too should become a world power. In order to do so, Germany would need to challenge Britain's control of the seas. Wilhelm II believed that the seas were not British, they were everyone's, and therefore the German Navy and the German Merchant Marine had a right to be there as much as anyone else. The problem was this greatly upset the British. So there was an aura of mutual suspicion and enmity building over the building of the German Navy. British fears were further confirmed in 1897 when word arrived that Germany's new luxury passenger liner, the Kaiser Wilhelm der Gross, had crossed the Atlantic with a speed of over 21 knots, a new world record. The Blue Riband now belonged to Germany. In response, the British began building larger, more luxurious, faster liners. One of these was a ship built for the famed British company Cunard. It would be christened the RMS Lusitania. The Lusitania was to be the largest, fastest, most luxurious ship ever built. It was designed to ferry passengers between Britain and the United States. 
At 785 feet long and 31,000 tons, the Lusitania was half again as large as the Wilhelm de Gross. She would be powered by immense turbine engines and four massive propellers. The Wilhelm de Gross had only two. Construction was completed in a record 14 months. On September 7, 1907, the Lusitania left Liverpool on her maiden voyage bound for New York City. Thousands cheered her off. It was the most amazing sight. What, what fascinated people was the towering four funnels because it, it was England's first four funnel passenger liner. And people were awestruck at the sheer size of the funnels and the height of the funnels. And that combined with the very sleek hull then of the vessel earned it the nickname of the Greyhound of the Atlantic. To go on the Lucy Turner was like going on Concord today. It was something you tell your, your friends about forevermore. And she had beautiful lines. She was a, a really nice looking ship. And it was a great adventure to go on board because for many people, it would be the only experience of that kind they would ever have. The Lusitania was a floating palace. Her first-class accommodations rivaled the most elegant hotels in Europe. Even second- and third-class passengers had amenities that had previously been reserved for the rich. The Lusitania featured the first shipboard electric elevator and a cavernous kitchen that could prepare up to 10,000 meals a day. No money was spared in assuring that the Lusitania and her sister ship, the Mauritania, would be the world's most envied passenger liners. Costs of construction were so high that Cunard required a loan from the British government for 2,600,000 pounds, roughly $13 million. But the British government imposed certain conditions. In the event of a conflict, the entire merchant fleet of the Cunard Line would be at the disposal of the Royal Navy. Instead of having to build troop transports, they could simply convert the existing merchant vessels of their own passenger lines to this kind of service, including the Lusitania. From her inception, the Lusitania had potentially conflicting identities. In the eyes of the traveling public, she would be the world's most elegant passenger liner but in the event of war, she might become a massive military transport ship. On her second voyage in October 1907, the Lusitania took back the transatlantic speed record. After 10 years, the Blue Riband once again belonged to England. In August of 1914, seven years after the Lusitania's maiden voyage, the world went to war. Soldiers marched off to the front amidst a patriotic fever. No one had any idea about what was going to transpire. That this would be a great adventure, be glorious, a short war. America's president, Woodrow Wilson, states categorically that the United States would remain neutral. Within months, those at the front realized that this would be a war like no other, a war fought with a devastating arsenal of new weaponry. In addition, the fighting would no longer be confined to the battlefield. The Great War is different from all previous conflicts because it obliterated the distinction between military and civilian targets. Nobody was safe in this conflict. And it was inevitable that that should be the case because this was a war of economies and industrial power as much as it was of general staffs and military power. So if an economy is producing what it is that keeps the war going, then to threaten an economy is the way to win the war. And the best way to do that is to cut the lines of supply 
which meant cutting the sea lines. Both Britain and Germany were dependent on their sea lanes and determined to keep them open. Germany had built a small but powerful navy. Their guns and armor were superior to those of British ships. But the British Navy was twice as big. Their strategy relied on establishing a naval blockade to keep supplies from reaching Germany. There was no real thinking about how long this blockade would have to last, but there was never any doubt that this was going to be the basic nature of the war at sea. British warships stopped and searched all ships, including those of neutral countries like the United States. They confiscated any materials that they felt would contribute to the German war effort. The United States government sent notes of protest, but took no further action. In November of 1914, Britain tightened the noose. The British government proclaimed the English Channel and North Sea a military area. Any German ship in the region would be sunk. The ships of neutral countries were advised to enter at their own risk. The British also announced, in defiance of international law, that they would no longer allow food to be shipped into Germany. Germany began to realize that this was going to affect the internal economy, it was going to affect how they were able to live, actually. And in fact, the British plan of bankrupting German trade began to immediately have results. By the winter of 1915, Germany began to ration food. And at the front, nothing had gone as planned. It just didn't work out the way they intended it. It was a bloodbath. That bloodbath stopped the German army in its tracks. So that instead of a short war, what happened was a war of position in which the greatest industrial powers in the world poured into a funnel on each side everything they had, turning a short military encounter of the 19th century kind into a 20th century slaughterhouse. By the end of 1914, there's a tremendous amount of frustration within the German leadership over the course of the war. And there's a determination that we have to do something different. We have to take new steps. We have to do things we never thought of doing before. Maybe they'll work, but at least we have to do something. The answer would be provided by a strange new weapon, dubbed the submarine. The modern submarine had actually been invented around the turn of the century. A number of countries had them, but prior to the outbreak of World War I, they were considered a clumsy craft useful only for patrolling coastal waters. All of that changed on September 22, 1914. A German Unterseeboot, or U-boat, sank three British armored cruisers in a single hour. Sinking three of these large British vessels proved the mettle of the German submariner. And the nature of the submarines, because they were such an extraordinary kind of vessel, it appealed to the romantic and the adventurous image in a way that ordinary sailors did not. These men were pushing the envelope of what the capabilities of men and machine were. Even though the Germans had a total of less than 30 U-boats, they realized that they had a lethal new weapon that could challenge the British at sea. On February 4, 1915, in response to Britain's starvation blockade, Germany proclaimed the waters surrounding Britain and Ireland an area of war. All enemy vessels encountered there, warship or merchantmen, armed or unarmed, would be destroyed. Neutral countries, such as the United States, should not entrust their crews, passengers, or wares on such ships. In response, President Woodrow Wilson sent a diplomatic note. In it, he stated that Germany would be held to strict accountability if an American vessel or lives of American citizens were sacrificed on the high seas. 
What they hoped to accomplish above all was a major disruption of British trade. That the British civilian would be hit at least as hard as the German civilian. And perhaps if the British saw that they too were vulnerable, that peace might be more attainable. And this was the thinking behind the German strategy. They couldn't do it through their high seas fleet, which was not strong enough to challenge the British high seas fleet, but they could do it with a submarine. But this new naval technology presented a problem. International law allowed warships to sink other warships without warning. But in the case of unarmed merchant vessels, an attacking ship had to first stop and search the merchant ship, sinking her only if war materials were found, and only after the crew was safely aboard lifeboats. For a U-boat, following these rules meant losing the element of surprise and risking the submarine itself. Once on the surface, U-boats were vulnerable to attack. Realizing that the only way to destroy a U-boat was to get it to the surface, First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, orders the conversion of 100 merchant vessels into Q-ships. Decoys designed to lure U-boats from beneath the waves and into the sights of a hidden cannon. Cash awards were offered for U-boat sinkings, and vessels were encouraged to fly neutral flags to disguise their English origin. The Admiralty also issued a secret directive, ordering all merchant skippers to ram German submarines. A ship like the Lusitania, which was capable of speeds over 20 knots, could easily ram and destroy a German U-boat. And this became part of the mentality for a large vessel like that, you can't take any chances. You can't come to the surface, fire a warning shot across her bows, send aboard a boarding party to inspect the cargo. You simply assume that the ship is carrying military cargo or troops and act accordingly. When the German submarine campaign began, enemy troop transports were a top priority. But of course, these troop ships are not constructed troop transports. They are British merchant ships, which have been converted for use by the British government. And therefore, you're already obfuscating the distinction between a merchant ship and a military ship. By the spring of 1915, the Lusitania's sister, the Mauritania, was carrying troops to the Gallipoli campaign. And the silhouettes of both vessels appeared as auxiliary armed merchant cruisers in the fighting ship directories of the United States and Great Britain. These books would be used by U-boat captains to identify potential targets. Although the Mauritania was now carrying troops, the Lusitania continued to ferry civilians through the German war zone. Despite the fact that German U-boats had sunk more than 50 merchant ships in the North Atlantic, Cunard and the British Admiralty refused to believe that Germany would sink the world's premier passenger liner. A light rain was falling on the docks of New York Harbor on May 1, 1915, as passengers arrived to board the Lusitania the ship was scheduled to set sail later that morning for Liverpool, England. This was to be its 101st transatlantic voyage. There would have been a lot of emotion, but all for very personal reasons, where people would have come to see their parents leave or saying goodbye to relatives and friends. But on that morning, a New York newspaper published an ominous warning from the German government. It read, Vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction. Travelers sailing in the war zone on ships of Great Britain or her allies do so at their own risk. Despite this warning, out of nearly 1,300 scheduled passengers, fewer than a dozen failed to board the ship. The 
passengers on board that day included the famous American millionaire Alfred Vanderbilt and Broadway's leading theatrical producer, Charles Froman. Both reportedly received personal telegraph messages warning them that the Lusitania would most certainly be a target for German U-boats. Both men apparently ignored the warnings. Author Elbert Hubbard was en route to Europe to become a war correspondent. When asked about sailing into a war zone, Hubbard snaps, I would not mind if they did sink the ship. I'd be a regular hero and go right to the bottom. The Crompton family was off to visit English relatives. Annie Kelly, a 19-year-old Irish immigrant, had arrived in America just days before. She had been turned away at Ellis Island for health reasons and was being forced to return to Ireland aboard the Lusitania. At the ship's helm was Captain William Turner. The 59-year-old mariner had risen through the ranks and was known to be jovial, yet with an air of authority. When informed of the German warning in the newspaper, Turner laughed and remarked, I wonder what the Germans will do next. Of the nearly 2,000 people on board, 197 were American. Don't forget, America at this time was neutral, and so many Americans who were used to making the transatlantic crossing still did, and to them it was just another crossing. They would largely be business class because business didn't stop because of the war. America obviously was still trading and supplying a lot of the manufactured goods for the, the war effort. Unbeknownst to the passengers, the Lusitania's cargo included American-made supplies and munitions bound for Britain. The ship's manifest listed 46 tons of highly combustible aluminum powder, unfilled shrapnel shells, and over four million rifle bullets. If only one bullet or one shell out of a thousand would have struck a German soldier, that would still mean that the cargo of the Lusitania meant death or wounding for 5,000 German soldiers on the Western Front. Now, whilst the passengers were blissfully unaware of the cargo, making them a target in effect, the Germans were well aware of the practice because they had spies at all times on the American ports. And the German embassy constantly protested to Wilson, the American president, that the American government should decide whether she was going to take passengers out of her liners or take out munitions, but not mix both. At half past noon, two and a half hours delayed, the Lusitania set sail for England. Just the day before, the German submarine U-20 had left its naval base on the north coast of Germany. The crew and the captain got along very well. Captain Leutnant Schwieger was known as a soul of kindness to his men, of consideration, and he was known for an unflagging sense of humor and wit. And he was well known throughout the German Navy for this. U-20's destination was the mouth of St. George Channel off the southern Irish coast. This was the gateway to the bustling English port of Liverpool. Cruising the North Sea, Captain Schwieger reported his position on the wireless no fewer than 14 times. What Schwieger and his superiors did not know was that the British were listening in. A secret group of British codebreakers used captured German codebooks to decipher signals to and from German ships and U-boats. Information regarding U-20's mission to the Irish Sea was given to First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill. For reasons that are still unclear, Churchill sent no immediate or specific warning to the threatened port cities of Liverpool and Queenstown. During the initial days of U-20's voyage, Captain Schwieger often chose to cruise safely submerged. Captain Leutnant Schwieger 
as a submarine captain from before the war, was one of those most aware of the vulnerabilities of a U-boat and why it was always best for a U-boat commander not to take any chances. Fog dogged their entire voyage, and this limited their visibility, their ability to find targets. Finally, as they round the southern coast of Ireland, they encounter a sailing vessel, which in the limited visibility, they take for a larger ship. That's why they stop it. To Captain Schwieger's disgust, the vessel was the Earl of Latham, a small three-masted schooner. Perceiving no danger from this tiny craft, U-20 surfaced and ordered the five-man crew to board their lifeboat. The U-20 then sank the schooner with cannon fire. The Earl of Latham's crew safely reached the nearby Irish coast. At dusk later that day, the U-20 fired a torpedo at the British steamer Cayo Romano, but missed. Cayo Romano quickly fled to Queenstown, where its crew reported the incident to the British Admiralty. Captain Schwieger and the U-20 had by this time been at sea for six days and had sunk only one insignificant sailing vessel. By her second day out, the Lusitania was well into the Atlantic Ocean. They basically had to entertain themselves. People would have sat on deck and read and chatted and just looked over and enjoyed the fresh air. Some, of course, were uh, not so fortunate and found themselves becoming seasick with any slight wave or heave then. And they had a miserable five days, groaning in their bunks, breathing in agony, and hoping this awful voyage would, it would end soon. The Lusitania carried 22 wooden lifeboats. Every day, the ship's crew performed what one passenger would later describe as a pitiful exhibition of a lifeboat drill. At the sound of a siren, eight crewmen lined up on deck, leapt into one of the selected lifeboats, and then on command, leapt out again and resumed their normal duties. Several travelers asked Captain Turner if lifeboat drills for the passengers might not be prudent. What if the Lusitania was attacked by a U-boat? He attempted to calm them, saying, a torpedo can't get the Lusitania. She runs too fast. On the night of May 5th, the Lusitania received two wireless messages broadcast to all ships by the British Admiralty in Queenstown. The first vaguely warned that a submarine was active off the south coast of Ireland. The second was a general navigational advisory sent to all homeward-bound British ships. It stated, avoid headlands, pass harbors at full speed, and steer a mid-channel course. The Admiralty also warned of a submarine off Fast Net, a small rocky outcropping off the southwestern coast of Ireland. At dawn, Captain Turner ordered all lifeboats swung out and made ready for lowering. The Lusitania was entering the German war zone. That same morning, Captain Schwieger surfaced just south of Koningbeck Lightship at the mouth of St. George Channel. Under the protection of patchy fog, Schwieger attacked and sunk two steamers, the Candidate and the Centurion. They're not easy sinkings. In one case, two torpedoes are necessary to sink a ship after they have already pursued the vessel and fired at it and struck it several times with shells. The crew disembarks, they put one torpedo into her, that's not enough, they have to put a second torpedo in before she sinks. The other vessel, they strike it with a torpedo and then eventually sink it with gunfire at very close range, again after the crew disembarks. That night, May 6th, Captain Schwieger was nervous. He was low on fuel and the persistent fog made it difficult to spot enemy patrols. 
Schwieger decides to head south. He's not going to stay in the Irish Sea. He's going to turn around and head back. Still 370 miles from the Irish coast, the Lusitania's passengers were oblivious to the dangers ahead. There was concerts, there was musical recitals. There was, of course, the whole rituals that went with meals, with eating, um, all of these things which seem to assume huge importance when you're on board ship because you can really look forward to them. Following dinner on the night of May 6th, the Lusitania's first-class passengers were entertained by a surprise guest. A wonderful Scottish tenor called Hamish McKay, who had just finished a tour of Carnegie Hall, he sang beautifully on the night at the ship's concert. And uh, everybody gave him loud applause and he was made swear and promised that he would sing again on the Friday night. Captain Turner also attended the evening concert. He reassured the passengers that the ship would reach Liverpool in good time. With thoughts of imminent landfall, the passengers turned in for the night. Later that night, the Lusitania received still another message that submarines were active off the south coast of Ireland. And once again, the general All Ships Navigational Advisory included the warning, submarine off fast net. The Lusitania was now only 18 hours from fast net. It was headed directly into the path of U-20. By the following morning of May 7th, survivors of the Candidate and the Centurion had reported their sinkings to Admiralty officials in Queenstown. News of the U-boat attacks had also reached the Cunard offices in Liverpool. Cunard requested that the British Admiralty warn Captain Turner that two large steamers had just been torpedoed in the area. On the Lusitania, Captain Turner had already taken some precautions. At dawn, he ordered extra men on deck with orders to look out for submarines. But as Turner neared the Irish coast, the Lusitania encountered morning fog requiring him to slow the ship from 21 to 18 knots. Later that morning, Turner received another message from the British Admiralty. It reported that submarines were active off Koningbeg Lightship, but made no mention of any ship being torpedoed. An hour later, Turner received a final warning. It stated, submarines five miles south of Cape Clear proceeding west when sighted at 10 a.m. Captain Turner no doubt regarded this as good news. Cape Clear was 20 miles behind him, and the U-boat was reported to be heading away if this was the same submarine sighted off Koningbeg Lightship, the waters ahead should be clear. Captain Turner turned the Lusitania east, aligning her with the Irish coast. What he did not realize at the time was that this was a fatal mistake. Schwieger spots what he thinks are actually several ships. He submerges because he wants to be in a good attack position. And then as the target closes, he realizes it's one ship, one huge passenger liner. Captain Schwieger would later write in his mission diary, sight dead ahead, four funnels. Dive to periscope depth and proceed at high speed on an intercepting course. On board the Lusitania, passengers had just finished their midday meal. And many people had just dined and come up on deck for fresh air and all remarked what a beautiful day it was. The blue skies of Ireland and the Emerald Isle was now visible and they marvelled at the lighthouse which they could see on the old head of Kinsale, about 12 miles on the horizon. And the, the mood was one of calm and, and peace then. And the feeling was, well, if we've got so far, the rest is a breeze, we'll be uh, home in a few hours. Aboard the U-boat, everyone is at their station. 
Everyone is tense because this is what they're there for. Only the captain has a view through the periscope. So the crew does not know whether they're facing a warship or they're facing a passenger liner. Next to Schwieger is a man who had served in the civilian merchant navy, and almost certainly he would have identified this ship as either Lusitania or Mauritania. It's listed as possible auxiliary cruiser. If it isn't, it's certainly carrying munitions, and it certainly will become a future troop transport if it isn't now. Therefore, get it. It took 60 seconds for the torpedo to travel from the U-20 to the Lusitania. A few seconds after it was launched, a lookout spotted the thin line of bubbles and screamed, torpedoes coming on the starboard side. But the warning never reached the bridge. 30 seconds later, another lookout spotted the same torpedo. This time, the warning did reach the bridge and an alarm was sounded. Captain Turner rushed from below just in time to hear the torpedoes slam into the ship's hull. She was struck at 10 past two in the afternoon, and that unfortunately coincided with the second dinner setting. So many people were actually in the dining saloons at the time, and they felt the thud of the explosion, and many others describe a, a rumbling sound. There wasn't any great panic at the time, because no one believed a ship that size could be sunk. And this, unfortunately, was fortified by members of the crew who told the passengers, some of whom had actually got into the lifeboats already, don't worry, she's not going to sink. Seconds after the first explosion, a second rocked the ship. The Lusitania lost all electric power and began to list to starboard. Then, as soon as the ship started to list, that made it even more obvious that something very serious had happened. So people tumbled and scrambled and fell over each other to get out on deck. They wanted to get out to sunlight. And even Captain Turner himself didn't realize the extent of the damage below decks. And his intention was to steer the ship towards the, the coastline and beach it, where obviously everyone could have been taken off. He also realized to a shock then that he had lost control of his ship. The helm of the engine room would not respond to his signals or controls because the machinery had been disabled by the explosion. She began to list very, very badly to starboard, and she was still making headway, and so the great volume of, of water was being sucked in through the hole in her bows. So even the least experienced of seafarers realized that she wasn't going to last. Several passengers were trapped in the now powerless elevator. Screaming for help, they disappeared into rapidly rising water. The ship's wireless operator frantically clicked off an SOS. Come at once, strong list, positioned 10 miles southwest of Kinsale. The ship's list was now so severe that panicked passengers stumbled along the corner of the floor and wall. On deck, it was pandemonium. Inexperienced and dazed crew members began lowering half-filled lifeboats. Boats lowered on the port side slammed against the massive rivets of the ship. The wooden crafts shattered, and passengers bounced helplessly down the hull into the sea. The lifeboats on the starboard side swung away from the ship, making them all but impossible to board. The launching of the lifeboats was a total fiasco. The ropes were lowered unevenly, and the result was that the few lifeboats got away, hung vertically, and their passengers were, were spilled back in the sea again. They were trying to get the women and the children on board the lifeboats and some couples just refused to be separated and just resigned themselves to the fact that if one of them was going to die, they were both going to die. At the other extreme you had absolute panic, people frantic, especially people who were separated from those they were travelling with at the time if they had their children in another section of the ship. It was within 20 minutes that they had to decide what they were going to do. Did they get into a lifeboat? Did they jump for it? When did they jump for it? When they jumped for it, where did they head for? Hundreds did jump. Those not killed by the plunge struggled to stay afloat. 
And the first reaction to the people floating in the water, their first precaution is to kick off their shoes because they found the shoes pulling them down in the water. When they were rescued, a lot of them were described as half naked, but that's probably how they survived. People are clinging on to floating rafts and wicker chairs and oars and boxes and crates. And now if a new fear comes into the floating masses, there's great fear then about the ships sucking down floating bodies in the, in the water and they try frantically but hopelessly to distance the, themselves from the ship. When the Lusitania sank, because she sank in about 300 feet of water and she was nearly 800 feet long, she went down by the bow. So the bow struck the bottom of the ocean. So when she slid down, she stopped and many survivors describe that and they saw her just judder the propellers pointing up to the sky, and she just poised there, just for a minute, and then went down. The RMS Lusitania disappeared beneath the Irish Sea in less than 20 minutes. There was a complete calmness then, apart from the crying of the people in the water, and the, the, the hopeless cries for help. But you had very distressing situations where you might have had a group of people clinging, as it were, onto one makeshift raft. But then, as time went by, and as the hours went by, one by one, they drop off. And the problem was, even though they could see the land, it was too far to swim to, and a lot of people expected that they'd be picked up, but of course they weren't. And so gradually the cries of people screaming in the water got less and less and less. Minutes after receiving the Lusitania's SOS, a flotilla of small fishing and naval vessels set sail from Queenstown and nearby fishing villages. But it would take them almost two hours to get there. As the boats approached the site of the Lusitania, they saw a huge and, and increasingly spreading mass of mixture of people bodies and debris floating on the water. They concentrated first on picking people out of the water. In some cases, if there were people in lifeboats, if they reckoned they could hang on all right, they'd leave them there. They went after people who were still floating. Many people, of course, were dead. The trawlers, the other boats, took on as many people as they could. And only when they were completely laden did they then turn and head back. But sadly, many of those died even before they reached Queenstown. Throughout the night, rescue boats returned to Queenstown Harbor. Wesley Frost, the US consul in Queenstown, later described the ghastly procession. Ship after ship would come up out of the darkness, and sometimes two or three could be just described as awaiting their turns in the cloudy night to discharge bruised and shuddering women, crippled and half-clothed men, and a few wide-eyed little children. The light of the following day revealed the full scope of the disaster. Of the nearly 2,000 people on board, 1,198 had perished. Many of those were women and children. 764 passengers and crew survived. Only six of the ship's 22 lifeboats reached land. All of Queenstown pitched in to help survivors find a warm meal and a bed. The injured were rushed to hospitals. First-class passengers were put up in the town's finest hotels. The rest in boarding houses or people's homes. They were in a state of shock. Some coped very well. Others literally collapsed as soon as they reached land because they had used up all their resources of strength just to get there, to keep their own spirits up, not to give up when they were trying to survive. Survivors wandered the streets desperately searching for their traveling companions, their relatives, friends, and children. In the initial few hours, there was great joy when people who thought that their relative or friend had died 
discovered that they were actually well. But after a certain time, there were no more survivors. Within 24 hours, the sinking of the Lusitania was front page news worldwide. The fate of its passengers became an international obsession. Among those lost was the brash American author, Elbert Hubbard. and the entire Crompton family. American theater producer Charles Froman handed his life jacket to another passenger. He himself drowned. American multimillionaire Alfred Vanderbilt also helped others before being pulled under himself. Also lost were Annie Kelly, the Irish immigrant on her way back to Ireland, and Hamish McKay, the Scottish baritone who sang at the liner's last concert. As the ship's giant funnels fell into the sea, a second-class passenger, William Pierpoint, was sucked into one and thought himself lost. But when the cold ocean hit the ship's hot boilers, he was shot back into the water like a cannonball. He sat on an upturned boat for probably a couple of hours until he was finally picked up. But he got back to, to England quite safely. And he died of old age in 1950. Captain Turner also survived the sinking. Swept from the bridge, he clung to a wicker chair for hours before being pulled from the frigid ocean by a rescue boat. Of the nearly 1,200 dead, only 200 bodies were recovered. Some of those which were identified were shipped out, that they were taken on board a train and were brought back to Britain or to the States. Some were buried locally in individual graves, but most ended up in three large mass graves that were dug by soldiers in Old Church Cemetery, about two miles north of Queenstown. And that was where the final funeral service was held on the Monday, a huge procession of coffins out of the town. Overnight, the sinking of the Lusitania changed the way the world viewed Germany and Germans. Americans were shocked. One American newspaper declared that the torpedo that sank the Lusitania also sank Germany in the opinion of mankind. In Britain, hundreds of shops with German names were looted and destroyed. In Germany, the reaction was decidedly different. In the immediate aftermath of the sinking of the Lusitania, Schwieger and his men were heroes. And everyone accepted the fact that this was a necessity of war, the Lusitania was either an auxiliary cruiser, as was thought, or at least it was carrying a good deal of munitions, which it was. Germany claimed that the munitions on board the Lusitania were the source of the massive second explosion, and that it was the second explosion which caused the ship to sink so quickly, resulting in the shockingly high death toll. If this were true, then by using a passenger liner to transport munitions, the British Admiralty the government of the United States and the Cunard Line would bear some responsibility for the death of 1,200 people. A month after the disaster, the British government convened a court of inquiry. Among the questions to be answered, had the Admiralty done enough to warn the Lusitania that there was a U-boat sinking ships in the area? Churchill and the Admiralty claimed that specific instructions and U-boat warnings had been sent, but that Captain Turner had ignored them. The evidence supplied the court were a compilation of excerpts taken from old Admiralty directives and from the many general submarine warnings sent to the Lusitania. The original messages, far more vague, were deemed classified and withheld from the court. They would not be made public for another 50 years. Despite the Admiralty's efforts to depict Captain Turner as negligent, the court absolved him of responsibility for the tragedy. 
the inquiry concluded that the Germans were solely to blame for the sinking of the Lusitania. The court further found that the second explosion must have been the result of a second German torpedo. The cause of the second explosion has been debated ever since. Was it a second torpedo? Captain Schwieger wrote in his mission diary that the Lusitania was sinking so fast that there was no need to fire again. And despite the assertions of the British court, there was never any evidence of a second torpedo. Was it then, as some believe, an exploding coal dust bunker or boiler room? Or was it the munitions, as the Germans had asserted from the beginning? There'll always be debates about why she sank so quickly, what caused, you know, was there a second explosion, what, what caused it all. At the end of the day, the result was the same. And the, the legacy, sadly, is, is in the graveyards. Of the 1,200 dead, 127 were Americans. Some in the United States called on President Wilson to enforce his proclamation of strict accountability by declaring war on Germany. But Wilson held out. The Lusitania sinking did not bring uh, the United States into the war. The political consensus behind such a decision wasn't there for another two years. So the Lusitania incident was much more important in propaganda terms than it was in military terms. The British used the sinking of the Lusitania to galvanize anti-German sentiment worldwide. As soon as the Lusitania was sunk, the assumption was that it was in the interests of Germany and indeed in the minds of German soldiers and sailors to kill children. That notion of inhumanity and barbarism became generalized to incorporate the entire German nation. Alarmed by the world's reaction, in September 1915, Kaiser Wilhelm orders U-boat captains to refrain from surprise attacks on merchant ships and passenger liners. This allows an unrestricted flow of supplies from the United States to Britain. Meanwhile, the British blockade of Germany continued causing increased starvation and suffering for Germans. In the winter of 1916 alone, Germany reported that 121,000 Germans had died of starvation-related diseases. On February 1, 1917, a desperate Germany declares unrestricted submarine warfare, ordering its U-boats to attack all ships bound for Britain, including American vessels. This finally prompts the United States to act. Nearly two years after the sinking of the Lusitania, America joins Britain and France in the fight against Germany. Captain Schwieger and much of his crew were by this time aboard a new submarine, the U-88. They continued their highly successful ways until September 1917 when U-88 struck a mine as it departed on its last patrol in the North Sea, and everyone was lost. Unrestricted submarine warfare would be Germany's final challenge to British control of the seas. The critical issue of the British war effort is keeping the sea lanes open. In some ways, that's what the war was all about, whether Britain would have the dominant position in Northwestern Europe to make sure that those sea lanes would be open. The Lusitania symbolized that collision. It was a massive contest between two countries for control of Northwestern Europe. And after four years of bloodshed, Britain won. The Lusitania's sinking had tipped the balance of power and the eventual outcome of World War I, and signaled a change in the nature of warfare itself. Somebody made a decision to sink that ship. And that, I think, was a sense of horror that people found very difficult to understand. The sinking of the Lusitania ended the Age of Innocence and brought the 20th century heaving into the cataclysm which it later became. With the Lusitania, you see that civilians are open targets. That war has reached the ultimate stage where survival is the only rule by which 
nations will conduct warfare in the 20th century. And it shows that war has changed and that everyone fighting the war has changed and that victory at all costs was the rule. And the Lusitania is the signpost that this is the way things are in the 20th century. Production of this program was made possible in part by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Educational Telecommunications Association and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS.